it is Mm -hmm. major challenges the main issues that we battle with in africa the illegal ivory trade sits right up there in terms of important challenges that africa battles with elephants were listed in appendix one of cites in 1989 this listing was brought about by the serious problems of poaching and decimation of elephant populations which literally brought our elephants close to extinction after the 1989 ban we had a period of relative calm and recovery of some of our populations but uh, it is sad to say that poaching then resumed and has continued and abated i'll just give you some pointers to just confirm that poaching is alive and well between 2008 and 2019, ETIS, the Elephant Trade Information System, recorded an estimated 393,100 kilograms, that's 393 tons of ivory seized from the illegal trade. It's important to remember that the seizures only are a small percentage of the ivory that is moving because traffickers move because they success in moving. And so we only get to catch a small percentage of what is moving between Africa and mostly Asian countries. 2011 was particularly a notorious year and it was labeled by traffic as a horrible year for elephants. An estimated 10,000 elephants were poached in Africa in that decade. Poaching continues and the numbers are not always clear, but because we see ivory moving all the time, we know elephants are dying. Most of the ivory, of course, is destined for markets in China, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, Singapore, Japan. And um, this is a serious problem for African elephants. Poaching results in serious loss of livelihoods for our people, militarization of our protected area, uh, uh, um, our, our, our wildlife organizations, serious problems of human rights abuses for our communities. Poaching is just a robber in Africa. It steals our resources. Now, I will quickly go to what is what do we do with ivory? Because ivory is coming into our stores all the time through natural causes, through these seizures. The problem with ivory is that whenever we, it has been put out for sale, it results in serious problems for African elephants. Some countries like Kenya have decided that the way to deal with ivory is to destroy it. I know many of you were um, able to see some of these images that came out of the ivory ban of 2016. I was privileged to work closely on this um, activity and actually led this project of destroying this ivory. It was a painful and time consuming and financial strain for Kenya. And yet, this is the way that Kenya chose to deal with ivory. In Southern Africa, many Southern African countries feel that wildlife ivory is a resource, and indeed other elephant parts are a resource that Africa should be allowed to trade. This is one of the dichotomous ideas in Africa, and we continue to try and sit together and debate and coordinate and talk and see how best to deal with ivory, because at the end of the day, elephants, belong to all of us and we need to agree on how to conserve them now we have other problems africa's population is estimated at 1.3 billion people and it's growing at 2.7 percent per year we estimate we could hit the 2 billion mark before 2050. a lot of these people live in the rural areas the competition for space and resources poses a major challenge for elephant conservation. Elephants are wide ranging animals, they need lots of space. And with all the demand for land for agriculture, mining, infrastructure, human settlements, all this happening in unplanned landscapes is a serious problem for those of us that have to deal with elephant conservation. We are all aware of the problem of human elephant conflict. I know for sure that in India, this is a problem that they are dealing with every day. I get my reports from uh, India on a daily basis, and I know this is a serious challenge. Human deaths, destruction of property, uh, livestock deaths, injuries. Um, these are serious conflict issues. 
our governments try to deal with this problem animal control by killing elephants, it doesn't solve anything. Sometimes it placates communities, but it doesn't really solve the problem. Human elephant conflict is a serious political issue because it impacts livelihoods, it, it impacts food security. Now, solutions are difficult to achieve in this human dominated landscape where land use planning is so badly done, but we continue as elephant conservationists to battle with these issues. We have the emerging problems of climate change, long and unpredictable drought cycles, erratic rainfall patterns, wildlife fires, alien and invasive species, new pathogens that we know nothing about. I'm sure you have all seen in the press that Botswana is currently grappling with the death, an explained death of elephants. They have so far counted 281 carcasses. They are unable to explain, even though they have sent the, the samples for analysis, it's impossible to explain why these elephants are dying. Is it new pathogens that have come about because of the problems of climate change? Are we facing yet another attack by viruses as we have seen with COVID-19? What's going on? Africa is totally unprepared to deal with the vagaries of climate change and all the issues that will come out of this problem. As we go on, or as we go on the big elephant in the room, COVID-19, who would have thought that a virus that is clearly related to the wildlife trade would impact the whole world as it has done? Who would have thought that these debates that we have at scientists, debates where we talk about the problem of raiding Africa and Asia and taking resources to countries that should not be using these resources for food. Who would have thought that those wet markets were going to stop the whole world? Now, when we think of elephant conservation and the impact of COVID, we know for sure that in many of our countries, conservation budgets are very dependent on tourism. We have seen a complete stoppage of travel. Tourism is not happening anymore. The budgets of our conservation organizations are badly hit. We have great fears of increased poaching because of reduced boots on the ground, because where is the money to keep paying salaries of all the rangers? It is really an uncertain future as global economies suffer due to COVID. Where are the priorities going to shift as national governments now focus on public health? as national governments have to save the lives of the people, what happens to conservation, and particularly of iconic species of elephant, like elephants that require so much attention? What do we mean when we talk about the new normal? As elephant conservationists, this is a real challenge for us. I will not leave you with just the grim picture. I will give you some success stories. As I've said in my earlier slides, we have 400,000 elephants in Africa. Some of these populations are stable and some are actually growing. We have elephants that are doing very well in Southern and Eastern Africa. Yes, we have challenges across a lot of the Af African elephant range, but we do have success stories. In my country, Kenya, we know that poaching is clearly on the decline and elephant populations are growing. Indeed, last week I was in Amboseli and it's raining babies in Amboseli. Every family has many little babies uh, with them. So we know the populations are healthy. We know that the elephant range is expanding as we, uh, we have success with community conservancies. More and more of our indigenous people are getting involved in putting aside land for conservation. Of course, COVID is going to hit us. A lot of these conservancies have their promise in tourism. This is where the livelihoods are going to come from. But we are willing to look again and see how to expand this livelihood so that communities can continue to, continue to conserve elephants. We have seen an unprecedented level of budgetary support for conservation by governments and partners, recognizing that conservation is a global concern and that everybody must come to the table. We have seen improved legal and policy flame frameworks, stiff penalties for wildlife crime in some range states. Indeed, last week, a very notorious crime ring, members were uh, jailed for a total of 56 years in Malawi, in Southern Africa. These are wins that we must celebrate because these international crime rings have caused us a lot of problems over the years. 
The investment in human wildlife coexistence is huge across Africa. Fencing, looking for innovative ways of enabling people to live with elephants. All these are going on as we continue to think about conserving our elephants. And of course, international collaboration in combating ivory trade continues to get many small gains. We have seen that major markets like China have closed. We just last week saw that Vietnam have closed their, their wildlife markets. We are optimistic that as the world starts to recognize the value and the role of conservation, they will work with us to close the demand because the, when the buying stops, the killing wills too. I conclude with questions because like I said, I cannot be able to um, get to a conclusion where I recommend anything for elephant conservation. So my questions are this, why do we need to continue protecting and conserving elephants? What is the role of the global community in this conservation efforts that we have? Where should we target our conservation efforts? I just want to put it on the table. For so long, we have been deflected by the illegal wildlife trade. A lot of our resources have gone into protection, into militarizing our wildlife conservation agencies. And yet, we could have spent this money on research. We could have spent a lot of this money on our communities. We could have spent this money expanding diversity and inclusion. We could have brought in more women, more youth in conservation. We could have expanded community participation in conservation management. If we were not chasing after international criminals, if we were not spending all our time trying to talk about why stealing our resources is the wrong thing to do, we need to think about these questions. How much have we deployed in innovation and emerging technologies in conservation? COVID has shown us that we cannot really continue with business as usual, something has to change. I now leave you with a photograph of my favorite place on earth, that is Amboseli National Park, with Mount Kilimanjaro in the background. Mount Kilimanjaro is in Tanzania, but the view is in Amboseli. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Um, after all our presentations, I would request you to uh, share these questions with us uh, once again. I will, thank you. Right, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was um, Miss, sorry, Dr. Vinnie Kiru. Um, Dr. Kiru is the founder of uh, CHD Conservation Kenya and a senior technical advisor to um, Elephant Protection Initiative Foundation. Dr. Kiru holds a PhD in biodiversity management with a focus on elephant conservation and management. Vinny is a former trust of uh, Kenya Wildlife Service. Dr. Kiru has recently been appointed by the cabinet secretary in the Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife to the inaugural board of trustees of Premier Wildlife Research and Training Institute in Kenya. She is a trustee of the Amboseli Trust for uh, Elephants, Kenya, and a member of the African Elephant Specialist Group. Mam is the chairperson of the Friends of Karura uh, Forest. Dr. Kiru is a member of the Kenya Association of Women in Tourism, where she chairs the Nairobi County chapter. She was named the KWT Women, Woman of Excellence in 2016 for successfully leading uh, Kenya's ivory burn and positive impacting, positively impacting Kenya's image globally. That was uh, Dr. Vini Kiru. Dr. Vini, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. It was indeed very insightful. Thank you. Thank you very much. We shall now move on to the next talk, which is Ecology, Relocation and Conservation Scenario of Cheetah in Africa by uh, Mr. Cosmos Wambua. To provide a brief introduction, Mm, thank you. 
thank you. Um, I don't think I've shared my screen yet. Right. Um, Mr. Wampa is the Assistant Director, Action for Cheetahs in Kenya, with a great love for wildlife and people who share their land with it. He did his undergraduate degree in biology from Dr. B. R. Ambedkar University in India through the government of Kenya Bursary. In 2002, he joined Cheetah Conservation Fund Kenya, which was fully funded by the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia as a research assistant with his work focused on issues affecting cheetahs outside of protected areas, which are still where majority of the cheetahs are found. In 2006, he joined Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia for his graduate degree and graduated in 2008 with a master's degree in ecological and systematic zoology. In 2009, Action for Cheetahs in Kenya was registered as a non-profit organization and continues to work closely with other organizations. He has had the opportunity to mentor young researchers in various aspects of wildlife conservation and community development and participation. Mr. Wombwa is currently in charge of research and administration and his team has grown to include a scat talk department that is integral to using non-invasive methods to look at genetic relationships of cheetahs in different parts of the country. Additionally, his team is also involved in studies on linear infrastructure ecology and its impact on permeability for wildlife in critical ecosystems. Mr. Wombwa, a very warm welcome. Request you to uh, share your screen and kindly begin with the talk. Thank you very much. Um, Yeah, just bear with me. I hope uh, my screen is shared now. Yes, it is. And thank you, thank you very much, uh, um, Anusha, and the Friends of Elef Elephant Team in India for inviting us to this webinar. Um, I'm quite honored to be able to share a little bit uh, uh, of my knowledge on uh, cheetah conservation um, with all of you. Um, as you know, uh, cheetah actually, the English word is derived from the Indian word cheetah, which means spotted one or many, many colors. Um, so I guess this is quite fitting um, that today I'll be talking to an audience uh, that is many on the Indian subcontinent. Um, now, the cheetah has had uh, a long history with human, um, human beings. And uh, this history meant that they were um, widely um, distributed. Um, and they are a very charismatic animal. And this is actually the reason that we chose cheetah as our focus species um, in terms of conservation of entire ecosystems. Our mission is to promote conservation of cheetahs through research awareness and community participation because most of the cheetahs are actually found outside of protected areas. But historically, their ranges were very wide from some parts of Eastern Europe, the Middle East, um, Africa, and Asia, cheetahs were very common, and they have persisted in some of the areas that I've mentioned, but uh, there are species that is uh, in a race to survive. They are extirpated in India. Uh, there is a small population that is still surviving in the Middle East, in Iran, uh, estimated at between 50 and 70 individuals, and their numbers keep declining. Um, then a lot of people will ask, you know, what is, why are these animals declining so much? Their, their estimated numbers in Africa 
are only around 7,000. And this is parts of Africa, excluding some parts in the central part of Africa, in the, in the, in the, in the tropical rainforests. But they are found from up in the Sahel. They occupy wide ranges of habitats, you know, from near desert, up in the Sahel and uh, down in Namibia, in the Namib Desert, uh, through the uh, bushed woodlands and open savannas in the uh, eastern part of the, of the continent all the way to Southern Africa. This uh, in habitats have also pushed uh, cheetahs to, to move into areas that we would not traditionally think that cheetahs would be found. Um, very closed uh, bushland areas, uh, cheetahs have been documented uh, to exist. The cheetah is an interesting animal because among the big cats, uh, the cheetah occupies a spot unique to itself. It's adapted for speed. Its body, everything about the cheetah is for speed. The body is streamlined in such a way that it can, um, it can reduce resistance to, to friction of the, the, when it's running. Uh, it's got semi-retractable claws that act like, you know, the spikes in running shoes. Um, and it's got a heavy tipped uh, tail uh, that acts as a counterweight and balances it when it makes these swift turns to follow its prey. But also, the cheetah had to sacrifice something. And in order for it to, to adapt to this life of speed, it sacrificed power and muscle. And that is why you will find that cheetahs will, will, will try to avoid any confrontation with other, um, uh, other big predators, uh, especially lions, uh, hyenas, leopard, um, even jackals uh, will, will scare hyenas. Their social structure is quite interesting. Um, the females will spend most of their time uh, bringing up babies. So with, the, with, with cheetahs, uh, they don't live in prides like lions. So the females will typically take the responsibility of bringing up the cubs. But in a litter, if there, there is more than one male, they will form these lifelong, um, lifelong associations or coalitions, and they will stay together for life. So even if they're more than four, they're more than five, they will come together hunt together as brothers, and they will stay together and hunt together and will take breeding uh, turns when they find a receptive female. They are mostly uh, diurnal uh, in their hunting methods. They will hunt uh, mostly early in the morning and late in the, in the evening when the sun is going down. But they also have very large home ranges. In most, of the, in most of the areas where cheetahs exist, research has shown that they are wide ranging, they travel a lot, they move and occupy a very, very large home range. But as I mentioned earlier, they are weak compared to other predators. And it is this weakness that has pushed cheetahs outside of protected areas. In protected areas where cheetah, where the other, the other large carnivals are protected and their numbers are high, cheetahs will find it very, very difficult to survive. So their numbers will remain quite low, but most of them will be pushed out into areas that are outside of uh, protected areas, basically national parks and reserves. When they come out of uh, the, the protected areas, then the likelihood of them coming into contact with human beings is inevitable. When they come into contact, mostly, it's usually through livestock depredation and retaliatory killings by farmers. However, cheetahs do cause minimum conflicts when compared to the other predators. 
but this this uh, this uh, the losses livestock losses are still have still have an impact on the livelihoods of local communities i'm sorry i meant to warn you that i have a couple a couple of pictures of some dead animals so i'm sorry if uh, if anybody is not comfortable with that uh, i do have a few pictures of some uh, dead animals so i'm really sorry i should have told you before anyway continued uh, loss of livestock especially to predators and in in particular uh, to cheetahs uh, leads to intolerance um, a lot of farmers or livestock farmers have a limit that they can allow once that limit is exceeded then retaliation can be a response however in some instances and i have i have to state this that uh, my next point uh, of relocation is purely based on country by country basis because of so many factors relocation is also and mitigating uh, a mitigating measure that can be used when you have uh, a problem uh, animal however when it comes to cheetah it is just one of a few remedies and it is extremely extremely difficult first of all to capture cheetah to trap them is very difficult and so when you are lucky enough to capture one or when you are lucky to capture a problem animal because of their classification the most ideal um, measure that is taken is usually to relocate that particular animal from where it's causing conflict to a different area another fact another thing that can can uh, can cause uh, relocation is rehabilitation after an injury if a cheetah has been injured and uh, the the authorities have intervened and they decide that that particular animal cannot go back where it came from then they can look for alternatives of where to relocate that animal however relocation comes with some serious questions because it's not just about moving an animal from one point or one area to another if in if it's in terms of a problem animal, there are questions that you have to ask yourself. Is that particular animal the actual animal that is causing problems? Are we moving a problem from an area to another? And because cheetahs range so widely, what are the probabilities that they will stay where they are relocated? What are the probable causes of livestock depredation? You know, is the animal sick? For instance, if you look at the picture to the left of my presentation, this particular animal has a condition uh, that the, the premolars have worn the upper palate and it's got an infection. So they end up taking livestock because it's much easier to kill than wild prey. Where do you relocate the animal to? If it's outside the protected areas, is the local community going to accept you to bring in a problem animal? So these are just some of the questions that you ask yourself. Um, and uh, you look at the needs in terms of ensuring that you do not just move an animal from one point to another. You will need constant mon monitoring. So a monitoring protocol has, has to be in place so that you know where the particular animal is at all times. The cost implications of moving that particular animal, there are so many decisions surrounding relocation that you have to consider. And at the end of the day, you ask yourself, you know, is relocation a value for money for conservation of that particular animal? Cheetahs, like most other wildlife, are facing serious threats. And these threats basically cut across the entire cheetah range. 
So be it Iran or Southern Africa, Eastern Africa or North Africa, these challenges are similar. They are facing a loss of habitat and fragmentation. And like Winnie mentioned, habitat loss and fragmentation is real and it affects virtually all wildlife. Cheetahs are unique in that they have a very low genetic variability. Basically, cheetahs are like identical twins. If you take a cheetah from Southern Africa and a cheetah from North Africa, genetically, they will be so similar. They're like identical twins. They're also facing diseases. Loss of prey base is a big problem. And then, as I mentioned, human wildlife conflict. These cheetahs, as you can see, the, the ones uh, down below, are suffering from uh, sarcoptic mench. It weakens them uh, so much that sometimes they will end up dying from secondary infection. But what is the conservation scenario for cheetahs in Africa? Because of the diversity in the African systems, actually the differences in national policies on land and wildlife, it is so difficult to look at the conservation as a one fits all situation. Each country is going to be a little bit unique, but there are some fundamentals that must be maintained in order to ensure the survival of the species. In Kenya, Action for Cheetahs in Kenya has been involved in research, which has gone to inform policy in terms of the future and management of the cheetah population. By using radio telemetry, we have been able to understand how cheetahs move through the landscape. We have been able to understand how they utilize the different resources that are found in these habitats. We have also been able to understand or to get a picture of their intimate lives at periods where we have assumed that cheetahs do not move a lot. This slide shows one female that we collared up uh, north in, 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 in Samburu National Reserve in 2010. And she provided us with so much information that we were amazed at how much movement she made at night because we thought she does have a very uh, low eyesight at night. But she was making most of our major moves at night. She crossed the river four times. She made hunts during periods of no moon. And this data was provided through the use of radio telemetry. However, with advancement in technology, we are moving to non invasive methods of gathering the same data, if not better data. Genetics, they help us understand the relationships between these individuals. We have had partners and students who are doing their studies looking at the fecal material of cheetahs. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we also have a canine team. And this team is dedicated to finding cheetah fecal material out in the field without necessarily having to get any close to a cheetah. So as long as a cheetah has pooped somewhere, our canine teammates will find that poop. Dogs are amazing. Their sense of smell and discrimination ability means that they can identify down to an individual cheetah. Apart from 
the general identification that this cat belongs to a cheetah. Dogs can be trained to identify individual cheetahs from a set of poops. And these are providing us with the, with the, with the, with the, with the platform to study cheetahs through non-invasive means. Because of the loss of habitat and uh, fragmentation, we have also been looking at uh, linear infrastructure. Um, railways, roads, pipelines, power lines, they're important for the economic development of the country. But just as, Lucy, as, as Winnie mentioned, poorly planned infrastructure causes fragmentation and in most instances it causes wildlife vehicular collisions which are not only dangerous with the loss of human life but also quite costly to the economy so linear ecology helps us work with planners for more consideration for wildlife needs and i have to 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 say that uh, right now through uh, various initiatives and platforms, we have been engaging with people that you would never have thought that as a wildlife biologist you would engage with. Engineers, planners, and the discussions have been amazing. When we stop colliding and seeming as if we are, we are, we are, we are differing on certain aspects, then we can be able to have a conversation and agree that our wildlife should also have a space in our uh, development. With diseases, cheetahs are quite prone to getting uh, rabies, getting infected from uh, dogs. And uh, as action for cheetahs in Kenya, we've also worked with partners up in, up in the north to try and minimize that cross species infection. So by organizing these annual rabies campaigns, working with the Kenya Veterinary Association and uh, vets who donate their time, we have been able to vaccinate dogs and reduce instances of rabies. But we can't, we can't, uh, we can't talk about the future without monitoring what is happening. We continuously keep track on the status of, prey, of the prey because the cheetahs at the end of the day have to feed. And if we lose the prey bear, it will turn to the only prey that will be available and that is the livestock. So we have continuously tried to do game counts. We continuously monitor uh, the, the situation of, of the prey and document any changes so that the authorities can take the proper initiatives to ensure that the cheetahs do not lack something to eat. Further, we know that reducing conflict, regardless of the species that is causing them, increases tolerance for wildlife. So we've also had studies ongoing on the efficacy of various lights to minimize loss of livestock from the homestead. Hyenas do come to the homestead. Leopard do attack livestock in the homestead. Lion do the same. Jackals will also take small stock. So if we can help the communities minimize their losses, their tolerance for the entire range of wildlife, including cheetahs, is increased. And finally, we cannot do it without our biggest partners. And these are the future generations who will be involved or who will be looking forward to taking the mantle and ensuring the type of issues. So we interact a lot with schools through videos, tournaments, we interact with the youth, and we also interact with adult members of the community and share the results from our studies 
so that they know what we are doing and feel as if they are a part of a community that is working together to ensure the future survival of the cheetah. I would like to thank all the students who have worked with us on various aspects from the deterrent lights, linear ecology, the, the continuing game counts, all of them, and the detection dog. I would like to thank all of them gratefully. And to our sponsors, we are always grateful and we appreciate your help, especially during these tough times of COVID-19 when resources are barely enough to run the organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wombwa, uh, for sharing light on the ecology, relocation, and conservation scenario of uh, cheetahs in Africa. We now move on to our next talk, which is by Dr. Ravi Chalam. And the topic is Is there conservation logic to the plans to introduce African cheetah in India? A brief introduction about Dr. Ravi Chalam. Doctor has been involved with wildlife research, education, and conservation since the early 1980s. His career includes stints with the Wildlife Institute of India, United Nations Development Program, Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, Wildlife Conservation Society India Program, Madras Crocodile Bank Trust, Foundation for Ecological Survey and Greenpeace, many of these in leadership positions. He studied the Asiatic lions and Gir forest for his PhD and has been involved with research and conservation of the lions since 1985. This includes field research, surveys, and preparing a plan to translocate and establish a second population of the free-ranging lions in India. He served as an expert scientific advisor to the forest bench of the Supreme Court of India in 2012. For about a decade, Doctor was the research coordinator of WII. Among the research projects he supervised at WII was an Indo-US project which looked at the impacts of habitat fragmentation on herpetofauna and small mammals of the Western Ghats. He has been involved in governance roles with several NGOs, including BNHS. Doctor has published extensively, worked closely with government on policy matters, and given several, more than 400 academic and public talks. He is currently the CEO of MetaString Foundation and director of the Mission Secretariat of the National Mission of Biodiversity and Human Wellbeing. Welcome to our uh, webinar, Doctor. Can I share my screen now? Yes, sir. Okay. Is my screen visible? Yep. Yep. Okay. Great. Great. Thanks. Um, it's going to be a very hard act for me to follow after these wonderful talks by Vinnie and Cosmos, uh, based in field research and sharing experiences and wonderful images. And I am going to be presenting largely facts and make an argument for the position I'm taking. Uh, so let me begin by first thanking Friends of Elephant and Wildlife Trust of India for giving me this opportunity. Um, I normally am invited to speak about lions. This is the first time that I will really be publicly speaking on this issue. So I have spent quite a bit of time reading up and trying to put this rather brief presentation together. What is the context 
with which we are dealing with here. The Asiatic cheetah in India was declared extinct in 1952. It probably became extinct a few years before that. And there is a current proposal to not bring back Asiatic cheetah, but one of the African subspecies from Namibia. And that too, not free ranging wild animals, but animals from semi captivity, animals which have been involved in cattle and game lifting, some of whom were captured and basically rescued from being shot by ranch owners. It is very well established. Cheetahs are very difficult to breed, especially in captivity. So it begs the question, how many cheetahs will we import over how many years? Of course, there is an estimate provided by the report which talks of bringing cheetahs over a fairly long period, something like 20, 25 years, with a founding population of about six, and then about five or six animals every alternate year. And you can do the math. What, what are the challenges, especially in the post-pandemic context? What about risks of disease? What are the kind of overall cost and cost effectiveness? And is there really a conservation goal? The last two, three questions is of what I will spend most of the rest of the presentation talking about. And in terms of recent history, this whole thing started with a meeting of global experts in India in September 2001, which resulted in a, a bit of field work and then a report authored by Dr. Ranjit Singh and Dr. Jala. This is based on surveys of 10 sites in seven landscapes located in several North, Central and West Indian states. Basically, ecological and sociological assessments to figure out whether these sites have potential uh, to harbor viable reintroduced. And the reason I have made it in Italix is because it's really not a reintroduction, but more an introduction because it's African cheetahs coming into India. Some of the outcomes they talk about is that this will enhance tourism prospects and thereby benefit local communities. And it will serve as a flagship for much abused habitats, essentially dry land ecosystems, which is a mixture of grasslands, thorn forest, scrub forest, dried deciduous forest, and the like. It's not as if we don't have charismatic and probably very highly and critically endangered species already in the Indian landscape. That's, I wonder why the wolf, the character, the great Indian bustard, the lesser Oregon, black buck, and much more don't quite provide us the required characteristics and charisma to be called as flagship species. And these are native, resident, and highly endangered species. And shouldn't they be promoted as the flagship species for these habitats? And I quote from the report, the venture must be viewed not simply as an introduction of a species, how charismatic it may be, but as an endeavor to better manage and restore some of our valuable at most neglected ecosystems and species dependent upon them. Most of my Indian friends would know what the current status and fate of tiger reserves and elephant reserves and corridors connecting may the ti other tiger reserves or other protected areas of elephant reserves are in India. How are we to even begin to believe that by bringing African cheetah into India, some of the challenges, the real life challenges that we are facing would be overcome? My personal position from a conservation biologist standpoint is trying to bring African cheetahs to India is a major distraction is a major drain of already scarce conservation resources, and it will never really work out 
as a species conservation concept, much less as an ecosystem conservation concept. But we are not merely dealing with conservation biology or conservation history. We are also dealing with a very strong and much more recent legal history. Of, of, what, what do I call it? Let's call it neutrally as the whole situation. There is the 2013 judgment of the Supreme Court. This is primarily on the line translocation. And because the government of Gujarat in court presented an argument that since government of India has decided to introduce cheetahs in Kuno, which is the site where the lines are to be reintroduced. And since cheetahs are smaller and potentially weaker species compared to lions, let the conservation, I mean, the, let the reintroduction establishment of cheetahs first succeed, and then government of Gujarat will consider moving lines from Gujarat to Kuno. So that's the context in which the Supreme Court had to view the plans and the then order of government of India sanctioning introduction of African cheetahs into Kuno. The court was very clear, and I quote from the judgment, it, it viewed African cheetahs rightly as a foreign species. It viewed the National Wildlife Action Plan and found no mention of bringing cheetahs from Africa to India. And it basically said that the decision of the Ministry for Introduction of African Cheetahs to Kuno first, and then the Asiatic line was arbitrary and illegal. It also went on to say it was a clear violation of the statutory requirements provided in the Wildlife Protection Act, which is by far the strongest act governing our management of wildlife. It also said the order of the ministry to introduce African cheetahs into Kuno cannot stand in the eye of law, and the same is quashed. So this is April 2013, and the same judgment also went on to, I mean, the primary uh, order, part of the order was, it said the lines from Gujarat should be translocated and reintroduced into Kuno within six months. The order was pronounced on the 15th of April 2013. We are now, now well past 15th of April 2020, which is a full seven years gone by, and there is still no sign of the lines being brought. And so, where they had squashed the, uh, the idea of bringing African cheetah, one sees strangely a revival of that idea. It seems even the court is not paying attention to its own orders. What is the next chapter of the legal history? In October 2018, the Supreme Court appointed panel submitted its report a very detailed report based on peer reviewed, unusually for a court uh, uh, order, a court report, very strongly based on science, and said basically that the required habitat for trade density does not exist in India. And it even blamed the government from Research Institute for incorrect presentation of data to get approval of the Apex Court. And it went on to say that India simply does not have, I've already said that, and it dismissed claims that cheetahs could coexist with humans, survive on a low prey density, and do not need vast tracts of grasslands. And I quote from the, uh, on the report, the reintroduction of cheetah has never been an issue of any significance, it's never been a subject of consultation among experts, much less widely debated, and therefore doesn't have support introduction of cheetah cannot be accepted. This is a report of a court appointed committee submitted in 2018, which came after the 2013 judgment where anyway the idea had been squashed. This is because I am assuming the government of India went of the 2013 order. Now the same Supreme Court, not 
too long ago in late January this year, has given an order on application of the National Tiger Conservation Authority to introduce cheetah In fact, corrected the National Tiger Conservation Authority saying you cannot call it a reintroduction, it is an introduction because African cheetah has never existed in India before. It has interpreted the 2013 order rather narrowly, saying the order was based on the fact that the court in 2013 found that the government hadn't conducted sufficiently detailed study to recommend the uh, introduction of African cheetah. And this order has only opened the door for further research and assessment, and not as some people popularly believe that it has actually ordered the introduction of African cheetahs in India. It also goes on to say that it needs to be introduced on an experimental basis to assess. I mean, after due research and assessment, if it still found uh, is viable to introduce African cheetahs, it needs to be introduced on an experimental basis to assess if it can adapt to Indian conditions. And if it doesn't adapt to a single location or site, then the site needs to be changed. So you can well imagine the time, effort, resources it is going to take to do all this. An expert committee has been appointed to guide the NTCA and to examine the viability of introducing cheetah at a larger scale. It has also asked the committee to report every four months. And since the order came in late January, I'm not sure very much has happened since the world we all live in has changed completely. And I doubt given the shortage of resources in general, and particularly the challenges all of us know we are facing in the conservation world, whether this can continue to be priority in the post pandemic world. I'm glad Cosmos preceded me. He has given us the challenges that he and other African conservationists and researchers face when they deal with cheetah in a much less densely populated habitat where you have reasonably abundant prey and some of the best uh, populations of cheetahs in the world. And we all know what the situation in India is as compared to those kind of habitats. We also need to ask the question, what is conservation about? Is it about populations? Is it about habitats? And what timescales do we need to plan for conservation? And if you really look at it really robustly and unemotionally, where are we and why are we even thinking of bringing uh, cheetahs from Africa to India is a question that all of us should really ask. I would, at a, at a personal non-scientific level, would obviously be delighted if we can get the cheetah back in India. I mean, imagine a habitat which, I mean, something like, who know, if it, if it can accommodate a thriving uh, population of cheetahs, could potentially have, and, and also lions to begin with, lions, cheetahs, tigers, leopards. I mean, uh, what kind of ecological questions that we can begin to address? And the, the ma we all understand the magic of wilderness, but large cats are special in many ways. And if you can have these four or five species roaming around with, with, a, with a suit of uh, smaller cats also to go with, and, and the hyena and the jackal, uh, so what a, a large aggregation of carnivores that we will get to observe and study. But I should set aside my personal views. To me, both the scientific perspective as well as the practical perspective tells me from a conservation priority perspective, from a cost effectiveness perspective, this is not tenable, irrespective of what the court might have said. I think the 20 or 13 order was well argued and we need to pay attention to what the court had to say there. And that's, that's essentially what I have to say, uh, but with the final thought that uh, I, I turn 60 next year, I've been involved with the Lions for a major part of my life, and I hope uh, at least before I die, uh, um, sense will prevail, uh, people will set aside their egos and 
political considerations and from a purely conservation perspective, uh, we will have a second population of Asiatic lions established in Burma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ravi Chalam. It was indeed a wonderful uh, session. Thank you for throwing light on the several uh, questions that um, arise when we talk about introducing African cheetahs in uh, India. We now move on to um, the last session of today. We will now have the question and answers um, that are being asked by several of our uh, uh, participants here and I would like to welcome Guraja sir. <laughs> Hello. All. Right. Uh, a brief introduction about sir. Uh, Guraja sir is an uh, ecologist specializing in uh, aneurin systematics, behavioral and landscape ecology and uh, bioacoustics. He is trained in GIS and remote sensing, biostatistics, ecological modeling, and research methodology. Uh, Sir has a PhD in environmental science from Kuempu University. He has completed his postdoctoral research at Center for Ecological Sciences, IAC, on the influence of land use and land cover changes on amphibians. He then joined the Center for Infrastructure, Sustainable Transportation, and Urban uh, Planning, IAC, as a research scientist and worked on urban ecological issues and environment impact assessments. Later, he worked as a chief scientist with uh, Kopi Labs LLP, where he is an adjunct fellow now. He is a strong proponent of citizen science and started the Frog Watch program on India Biodiversity Portal. He, is, he currently teaches theoretical framework and the use of GIS and remote sensing in public space design for master's students in Srishti Institute of Art, Design and Technology. He teaches complexity and living systems in earth education and communication. He also teaches technology and biological systems to experimental media art students. So I would request you to kindly take over the session. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Anusha. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Vinnie. Uh, Ravi and uh, Cosmos for your wonderful presentations. Uh, I have uh, a list of questions being posed uh, at uh, each one of you. Uh, what I will do is I have sorted out to individually the questions. Uh, once that is done, probably uh, we will take uh, collective questions also. So I'll start with uh, Dr. Vini. Uh, this question is from Prachi Mehta. Uh, she says, uh, please share your views on immunocontraception of elephants. Is it effective in Africa? <laughs> right. So there have been a number of trials, um, experiments that have been done on immunocontraception. And the idea is to apply these techniques on smaller conservation areas. It is a common challenge, particularly in Southern Africa where there are elephants confined to fairly small conservation areas. And when they start to impact the uh, environment, the vegetation, then people feel the need to use contraception to control the numbers. It is a very controversial area. It's a difficult um, issue because the delivery of this contraceptives is quite invasive. It requires that the elephants are also put under um, sedation for them to be deliver the contraceptive. And also with so many different hormones involved in the uh, fertility process of the elephants, it is a hit and miss a lot of times. And so it's one of those areas of serious controversy and there is difficult, it's difficult to understand how this can be scaled and used to really control elephant populations, especially wild ranging populations. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vini. There is one question from uh, Dr. AJT John Singh. Uh, he has a couple of questions. Uh, one of which uh, is looking at your Kilimanjaro photograph. He uh, says, how much snow is left over there? And habitat degradation is enormous in Botswana. Elephants are sure to die. Any comment on that? That is one of his questions. And there's also one more. 
where, uh, okay, I will come back to that later on. Yeah, this is just one of the questions to you, Dr. Winnie. I was actually surprised last week when I was on in Amboseli. Kilimanjaro had a lot of snow. On the oh, snow. okay, okay. <laughs> there was a lot of snow. So sometimes it looks very bare. I think these are the vagaries of, of climate change that you, you know, uh, we are certainly seeing reduced snow caps both on Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Kenya, but uh, there are days when there's certainly a lot of snow. For sure, when I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, I was asking myself with every step why on earth I tried, but I did get to Uhuru Peak. There was a lot of snow. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. That's a very good thing. Uh, Dr. Bini, there's a question from uh, Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, S310, I think it's the room number. Uh, has the cause of mysterious mass deaths of elephants in Botswana uh, been revealed? Uh, and, and connected with that, or there are a couple more questions. Uh, one is that, uh, uh, Mr. Naveen is asking, I recently read about elephants dying in Botswana. What are the reasons and how could this be avoided? So these are the couple questions on the uh, mass death of elephants in Botswana. Was okay. anything revealed? Yes, indeed. I expected quite a number of questions on this because this issue has been very big in the press recently. Um, I mean, huge diebacks of elephants do happen sometimes. The reasons that are usually um, attributed to these deaths could be drought, prolonged droughts. And sometimes, particularly in, uh, we had one situation in Kruger National Park where the deaths were uh, attributed to a virus that causes heart failure in elephants, the EMC virus that causes heart failure. There are also sometimes implications of toxicology, um, in situations that have happened sometimes in Zimbabwe where cyanide poisoning of water sources has resulted in the death of elephants. Oh. Now, in the case of Botswana, investigations are still going on, but oh. just from observation, scientists have been able to rule out the issue of drought because indeed yeah. there was a fairly good rainy season preceding this event. And these elephants are also very wide ranging because they are able to move between within a fairly large area of the, uh, uh, a large conservation area. The other thing that seems to have pointed people in the direction of a pathogen or something like a virus is because the elephants were observed going round and round in circles, almost like something was impacting their nervous system. Um, the chances of this being a poisoning event were ruled out by the fact that usually during poisoning events, other wildlife would die. Vultures, for instance, that would eat these corpses would be seen to die. And other wildlife species that depend on the same water sources. So we, even at the African Elephant Specialist Group, have kind of tried to eliminate some sources. And what we are waiting for now are results from the lab analysis. These elephants have died in a very remote area. And so to even deliver samples in a state where they can be conclusively uh, um, you know, worked on is, is fairly difficult. That said, I think that it, people have waited a long time and I believe the Botswana government recognizes that we are all anxious for answers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. hope uh, people got the response for the questions that you guys asked. Uh, uh, there's another question from uh, Nupur Bhave. She asked that, could you please comment on the role of elephant tourism in conservation? Okay, now the kind of tourism that we have in East Africa is mostly photographic tourism. This is where people come, um, you know, they drive around in, in tour vans and basically uh, look at elephants, photograph them. And, uh, you know, that is the kind of tourism we have. Of course, there are variations of tourism. For instance, in certain parts of Southern Africa, there's tourism that includes people riding elephants and uh, uh, those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. This has been a very challenging in the East African context, this is not very much embraced. And even in the terms of elephant conservation, it seems like uh, a, 
an activity that generally predisposes elephants to welfare issues that cannot really be encouraged. And so I know that these practices do take place in other continents. I know in parts of Asia, in Thailand, I have seen elephant rights, I've seen elephants domesticated for various reasons. The real concern here is the welfare issues around elephants, very intelligent beings um, that need to range very widely, very social beings. And when they are confined for human entertainment, they suffer serious welfare issues. So, you know, the concern, of course, is that yeah. this has no value for conservation. And I'm not sure that it is worthwhile to mm -hmm. spend the kind of energy and resources to just put elephants out there with the serious welfare issues just for the for human entertainment mm. yeah uh the next question is from uh sus peter kiambi uh he uh, says thank you for the presentation and congratulations for the appointment as chair uh, of the inauguration wildlife research and training institution for kenya and his question is what are the potential conservation implications of the proposal to split the African elephant into two species? Okay, that's a really, really pertinent question, very important question, because um, there has been a lot of studies trying to check whether the forest elephant, which is, uh, can be categorized as uh, Loxodonta cyclotis, while the African bush elephant is Loxodonta africana. Now, this has been a subject of research, but also politics. <laughs> research, <laughs> in terms of, <laughs> there have been studies showing that if you look at mitochondrial studies, it seems like there has been instances where forest elephants and savanna elephants have actually um, uh, had offspring. That would mean that they are not separate species. However, recent studies seem to have gone deeper into this and shown that they actually split at about the same time when the Asian elephants and the mammoths split. Now, what would this mean for conservation? It would mean that we would need to reprioritize conservation programs for African elephants and give particular emphasis to forest elephants that are really seriously endangered and that have had serious problems in as far as decimation by the poaching um, problems. So it, is a political problem because it would require certain adjustments, for instance, the categorization of elephants within the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, the way in which uh, resources are allocated to the yeah. conservation of this species. And so research seems to point us in the direction of uh, separate species. Politics says we keep them together because yeah. of the reallocation of priorities for this species. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice point to look into. Uh, there's another question from V. Dinakar. Uh, Dr. Vini, with economic development and human settlement expanding, HCC is going to increase in future. What kind of steps need to be taken to reduce the uh, HCC going forward with economic development also happening side by side? Can you share any projects that have been successfully implemented and showing positive results in Africa to address this problem? Uh, I think HEC is human, human elephant conflict. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Human elephant conflict, I believe, is one issue that ourselves and our Indian counterparts can really share a lot of notes huh? <laughs> because yeah, yeah. we have elephants and they are all uh, trying to survive in fairly human dominated landscapes. And indeed, there's a lot of room for innovation and scientific research that can help us to improve the levels of coexistence. Well, where the rubber meets the road is really yeah. the level of tolerance that our rural communities can have towards elephants. We have serious livelihood issues and rural poverty issues. And so there is a development angle to this in terms of if we are going to continue to have elephant sharing space with the most vulnerable people in our communities. It may be that we need to sit at the table with big government, as Cosmas was saying, and discuss exactly how to focus on the livelihoods of these communities that we expect to continue living in wildlife. 
There are compensation issues involved. There are, of course, issues of separating agricultural areas with wildlife areas. There is also the whole aspect of land use planning. The idea that our politicians are not willing to make the tough decisions about whether we should have areas for elephants with buffer zones and where do we relocate these people who are the most vulnerable in our communities. And so it is a complex issue. Indeed, there are local success stories. Like I said, our community conservancy programs are doing very well, but this is an issue that continues to be a real elephant in the room for mm. African communities. Wow. I hope that helps. That is a related uh, question by Shubham. Uh, he says, my question uh, is to Dr. Vini. What is the role of local people in conservation of elephants in Africa? I think you addressed it a bit, but if you can elaborate on it, it will be more helpful. This is also a really pertinent question because yeah. for many of us, you know, conservation has been elitist. We have looked at conservation as something that is done by people who live away from the species, people who come and impose their ideas on the local people very little regard for indigenous knowledge and what the local people know in terms of coexisting with wildlife. Big government goes on to put in infrastructure projects in But to stand up. There will be a few um, really people from your country standing up. There will be a lot of people from elsewhere that have come and studied your species quite deeply and have very clear views on what you need to do. And this is something that has a real north-south issue to it. You know, I, we, we need to start figuring out who the experts are. We need to also follow the money because a lot of time, the experts from the north are there because they can be able to follow the money. And the local experts seem to not be able to find the resources to help. And so both from a community perspective and also from a perspective of how do we do the science, which science is valuable. Is science mm. only valuable if it comes from Oxford University mm. or is there valuable science that can be done by the citizens? So we need to totally rethink how we work in this, in this space of conservation that yes, we have received valuable help and support from partners and friends outside our spheres but as we are emerging scientists, let us remember that our people ultimately are the ones who live with the wildlife. And their participate. I don't even want to call it participation because participation assumes you turn up, you do something and go away. But actually their total empowered involvement in conservation is what is going to save the species in the end. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you, uh, Dr. Vini. This is local people participation is quite essential, and also what you spoke about who is the expert? Is it from the north or from the local? Uh, yeah, I will also uh, take a couple more questions to you, then move on to uh, Cosmos. Uh, the next question is from uh, Avijan. He says, a few days ago, one of the elephants died by herpes virus in our state of West Bengal in India. I want to know uh, that how many elephants are suffering due to this virus in Africa every year? Is it really a serious threat? Now, this virus actually seems to impact elephants in captivity more ah. than elephants in the wild. Huh? Hmm. Um, I, I'm not privy to the real uh, extent of the herpes virus in the wild in Africa, but I know for sure that in my studies around elephants in captivity, the herpes virus is a serious challenge. It could be stress-related because it is very, very, very uh, 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 
prominent in elephants that are held in captive situations. So I don't know whether this question is uh, directed to a captive pop, uh, uh, elephant or is it elephants that are found in the wild. But I can say for sure that I do not have enough information on okay. how serious this virus is in wild elephants. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, one more question uh, by uh, Budhan. Uh, what is your opinion on management culling of elephants for population control? What efforts are in place to capture the genetic diversity of extant elephant? For example, banking biological samples, semens or tissues in that sense. Thankfully, the culling of elephants has uh, become one of the conservation tools that has been discarded in okay. most for the simple reason that we now understand a lot more about elephants. We understand that they are social beings, they are very intelligent, they live within families, they depend on each other a lot. And all culling operations have led to serious stress factors for the elephants. And so for now, almost 20 years, there has not been in the use of culling as in the form of population control. Additionally, we are talking about a, a, a species that is threatened with extinction. So really, the more ap 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 appreciated conservation measures are the ones that encourage wider ranging elephants. So for instance, in Southern Africa, we have the trans frontier parks, which try to bring together five different countries, allowing elephants to move over a wider range. We also have initiatives where communities are now being encouraged to expand the buffer zones around oh. protected areas so that elephants can range wider. And translocation of elephants, of course, to reduce the pressure where they pro there is a lot of local pressure by elephants. And so really, I think Africa has recognized that culling not only has huge welfare issues, but it is also doesn't any make, make any sense for a, for a population of elephants that's declining so fast. Uh, thank you. And one last question to you. Uh, I think it, it also can involve uh, Cosmos here. Uh, this is by Kartik Gokhale who asks, what is the stand of the uh, government in African countries contrasting development and conservation in courts? I think that is really the question for every conservationist. Yes. It is a competing interest. The definition of development in as far as government is concerned is more railways, more roads, more airports, more urban settlements. And yet, for the conservationists, the question is, if we are really going to have healthy ecosystems, and we now from COVID have learned that healthy ecosystems yep. also include healthy people, we really do need to have our one health approach. Otherwise, governments will be building all these roads and then spending all their money solving public health issues, right? So yeah. I think the important thing is to create platforms where we can talk to each other and be able to appreciate what the role of conservation is vis-a-vis -vis development. And I think that while we chase a development model which is sold to us by the West, that the more roads and the more concrete we have, the better we are. And yet in the West, people are dying to protect one tree. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, it's really important for our governments to appreciate that already we are wealthy. We are the most mega diverse part of the world. Asia and Africa. We are already wealthy. We don't have to use the symbols of wealth that come yeah. from elsewhere. But these conversations are difficult because we think that a development counters is counter to conservation. It is not. They work yeah. hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. I do agree with certain views of yours, Dr. Vidi. Uh, uh, thank you very much. There are a couple more questions. I think I will come back to you uh, probably at the end of uh, uh, this conversation. Uh, now we will uh, take a couple of questions to uh, Cosmos Wambua. Uh, this is a question from uh, Dr. John Singh. He has a couple of questions for you. Uh, it starts with, does cheetah occur in the hilly areas of Africa? That's one. And the second one is, can baboons rob the kill of cheetahs? So these are the two questions from uh, Dr. A.J.T. Johnson. Uh, from 
Thank you very much for, for, for those questions. And uh, just to go straight, yes, I will respond with uh, yes, they do occur. Although I'm not quite sure what, um, what kind of hill he is talking about. Uh -huh. um, if he is asking, you know, living like in rock outcrops like leopard, then no. But they will, they will, they will move through um, hills. They will go through hills. But spending time there, very minimal. Hmm. And uh, for the second, the second question. Second question is: uh, Can baboons rob the kill of cheetahs? Of course, yes. Okay. Cheetahs are, are like the weakest of the the the, the, the larger cats, and uh, they will avoid confrontation at all costs because they depend on their speed so much for their survival. They yeah. would rather leave whatever it is than fight for it. So most of the times, yes, baboons, of course, they, they rob cheetahs many, many times. Oh. Oh. Baboons yeah. are, a, they are a serious, serious <laughs> threat. And they, they have no problem with killing a cheetah. Ah. Okay. Yes. Very, very nice. Very nice. Okay. Uh, uh, this is a question from V. Dineker. Uh, he says, recently there was news to reintroduce cheetahs in India. Think it is going to change the balance in ecosystem since it has been missing in this landscape for a few decades now and will take quite a while before things settle. Please share your thoughts. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, there there are definitely pertinent questions um, yeah. that uh, uh, Dr. Ravi raised. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people have raised when you look at um, bringing in um, an animal that has been extirpated uh, in an area, uh, reintroducing it back, and uh, going to go as far as to re to introduce because it's not reintroducing you actually introducing yeah, 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 yeah. African to India. I think uh, it is a debate that is going to reach. Uh, but personally, if you ask me, um, India has very many charismatic uh, species um, that are also facing the same threats that cheetahs mm. are facing out here. Mm. And uh, the, the reasons why the cheetah uh, got extinct in India in the first place, I don't think they've, 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 they've all been sorted. Um, so there would be no guarantee. I mean, it's just adding another problem to an, to, to already existing problems. Uh, it is having problems with uh, with uh, tigers, um, you know, human wildlife uh, conflict also is a big thing. Um, but personally, I think there is definitely going to be a lot of debate that yeah. needs to happen. Um, and it's a decision that should be taken with sober minds, mm -hmm. uh, with 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 all precautions. Okay. Okay. Thank you on that. Uh, then uh, there's a question from uh, Prachi Mehta. She says, "Mr. Cosmos, which carnivore species stops the cases of human wildlife conflict in Africa? Is it cheetah, leopard, or lions?" Oh. It's it's a bit difficult to say. Um, because these three uh, species are actually very different. Cheetahs <laughs> usually take livestock uh, <laughs> mostly when they're out grazing. Uh, but uh, when a leopard goes into a livestock enclosure, they will do quite a big damage because they will virtually kill mm. everything that moves. Okay. Um, so when, when, when you look at the, the, the damage, uh, cheetahs are more tolerated by livestock farmers mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they, they, they rarely kill more than they, they need. Ah. Um, but when, when you look at uh, the other species like lions and leopard, leopard will go into an enclosure and kill um, virtually all, all the animals in that enclosure. Then lions definitely will... will, will uh, will take out uh, large uh, livestock like cattle. And so the economic cost, the economic impact is, is quite significant. However, um, 
I'm not minimizing the, 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 the losses in any way. They, they, they still have an impact on, on the communities that share their, uh, their, their land with, with this uh, wildlife, but the, the, the impacts are, are a little bit different. And when you look at the, when you look at leopard, um, they are quite, uh, quite diverse in their diet uh, and very adaptable. So they can do with a lot of things, lizards, mice, rats, uh, a leopard is at home with those kinds of things. Uh, so in terms of which one is, uh, has more impact, I would say whichever species has, um, is, is dominating the landscape in that particular area. You're muted. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, so probably her question was also related with uh, the new trend in India of having leopards close to human habitats, which we thought we didn't know about it. Leopards should live in only forests, but now we are realizing that they live in close connect with uh, human habitats. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Uh, it's, it's one of the questions from my side and it has a, a follow-up question from Naveen. Uh, there was a paper from uh, Rai et al. in 2020. This came in scientific report, which shows that there's a deep divergence of Indian cheetah from what was previously known. Uh, and how does this impact on Indian cheetah reloc relocation or introduction program? And a follow-up question is that if African cheetah uh, relocation to India, could Asiatic cheetah from Iran be relocated if African is not relocated? Also considering the failure of Iran in conserving the species. So uh, there are, these are a couple of questions. This is based on molecular analysis. Uh, do you have any say on this? Um, well, as I said in the first question, I think yeah. the, the issue of uh, introducing the African cheetah to India yeah. is, is, is going to be a debate that, uh, you know, as, as um, as uh, the Indian community, you will have to to have this conversation about. Um, there is always definitely the danger of reintroducing uh, or bringing in um, a species that you, you know has not uh, has not existed in, in in that particular country almost seventy years now uh, since the last cheetah was was uh, documented in India. Um, so the the issue of bringing in African cheetah um, into India, as I said before, you you, you already have um, yeah, enough other, enough. other yeah other other species and other, other problems with with the with the with the with the species that are already there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now for uh, bringing in. Iranian cheetahs, I think even the point would be mute because of the the very low numbers that are existing mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, in Iran. Yeah. So your chances of uh, inbreeding are quite high, uh, yeah. whether you get two more individuals a year or three more individuals from the same population, because the population is so small. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those, those, those are also yeah. uh, things yeah. that are yeah, they, they should pay attention to. Okay, okay. Uh, there's there's a question from uh, Dr. Winnie to you. What is the uh, thank you very much, Cosmos? What is the impact of uh, illegal trade in cheetah cubs on the conservation of cheetahs? Are doing any work uh, to create awareness to the demand countries? Um, you know the. To understand why the cheetah is in problems right now, we also have to look uh, to look back at history. Mm -hmm. uh, and during the, the Mughal Empire, very many cheetahs were, uh, very many cubs were taken from the wild. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why cheetahs are favored for pets is because they are easily tameable. Mm -hmm. So they eat on humans quite quickly, and the, they 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 bond very well with humans. So 
there is there is uh, the the taking of of cubs from the wild is definitely going to have an impact on the future conservation of the species mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. in the first place the 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 cheetahs lose uh, lose uh, a lot of their cubs naturally they yeah. lose yeah. 90 95% of their cubs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so when the remaining 5% some of them are taken for illegal trade mm. then you have a problem so it's a threat now uh we work with partners as as as, as an organization we 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 do not have any authority to enforce anything but we can share information so mm -hmm. we work with the government agencies to ensure that if we if we get information on any trafficking that is going on that information is passed to the relevant authorities mm -hmm. but i can i can assure you that there is concerted efforts especially working with the somaliland government mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it seems like Hargeita is a major trafficking point into the middle east united arab emirates and yemen mm -hmm. so um as you know there is a conflict in yemen uh, mm -hmm. right now it's ongoing yeah and uh, yeah. the iucn is engaging with international partners to try and dissuade people uh from owning some of these big cuts yeah. including cheetahs okay okay yeah, yeah. uh thank you uh mr cosmos wambua uh, I will move on to a uh, couple of questions to Ravi, and I probably will come back to uh, both of you, uh, Dr. Vini and Cosmos, later on. Uh, Ravi, uh, are you there? Uh, there are a couple of questions for you. Yeah. Uh, the first one is from uh, CC CCMB S310 uh, to Ravi. Is that has there been any case of successful reintroduction into the wild of cheetah from captive rice population? Uh, I am not aware of that. Uh, Cosmos is probably better place to uh, answer that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I am aware of free ranging cheetahs being translocated and establishing successful populations. Uh, but in fairly highly controlled uh, situations, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. whether captive cheetahs have been successfully released uh, to establish free ranging population, I am not aware. Okay. It would be so much more difficult to do mm -hmm. it with captive bred uh, animals than from free ranging animals. Mm -hmm. As a general general point. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the next question is from Adarsh. Uh, he says recent news suggests uh, carving out area in northern Gujarat, far away from gear for lions. If this formulates, then can it be considered as secondary population to ensure them safeguard against possible disease or inbreeding depression? See, first of all, translocation is not about inbreeding depression. Yeah. We have what we have. As much as the 7,000 odd cheetahs have gone through a genetic bottleneck, the Asiatic lion population has gone through a genetic bottleneck. Yeah. But if you look at the current population, you see them not necessarily suffering from the genetics. They all look like lions should look. Uh, they hunt, they breed. There is reasonably good cup survival and the population is growing. Yeah. But it's really about mitigating risks. Mm -hmm. And for long, we have been in denial saying, oh, it has never happened in India. But since 2018, there have been dozens of lions dying mm. through disease, including canine Ooh. distemper virus. So in many ways, we are sitting on a ticking time bomb. To specifically answer Adarsh's question, which I've also done on the chat. Box, yeah, yeah, I just saw it, yes. The distance has to be significant. Hmm. What they are talking of is Burda. First of all, it is less than 200 square kilometers. So it is, hmm. it is, it is like more like a safari park than a wilderness habitat. I mean, lion yeah. tribes need large areas to survive. Second, it's less than 150 kilometers from where Gir is. So if, if there is a disease outbreak in gear, we all we've yeah. seen how COVID-19 has spread. So, Absolutely. you know, that, that's yeah. not going to provide you the buffer. Who knows, at least a thousand kilometers away. Yeah. So it 
it does require that kind of, and Kono is more than 3,000 square kilometers of forest. So it's a very, very large forest tract with a central national park area of about 800 square kilometers. Yeah. Uh, next question is by uh, Shubham. Uh, he says, my question is for Dr. Ravi. Can you please explain the proposal of reintroducing cheetahs while we are facing a lot of problems in conserving native wildlife of India? And as explained by Cosmos, the cheetahs live in large home range. How African cheetahs will survive in such small areas in India while competing with other large carnivores like tigers and leopards? Yeah. I, I hope my central message through my presentation, which was that it is a misplaced idea. Mm -hmm. It has been poorly thought out. It would be a very expensive financially and otherwise. Uh, so I don't think we should get into that kind of detail at this point of time, because I don't think it's a good idea to begin with. And the court hasn't actually ordered the introduction of African cheetah. It's only asked for more research to be done. And I doubt very much if you can keep importing African cheetahs and establish a population. The conservation objective goals are not clear, are not hmm. defendable to begin with. There has not been enough scrutiny, debate, uh, in, in the public domain about this. I mean, should we be focusing more on African cheetahs or Great Indian Bustard and Caracal and Wolf and so on and so forth? And, and so many other, I mean, reptiles, insects, flora of these kind of habitats. Yeah, yeah. We know what's happening to our tiger reserves and elephant reserves. I mean, uh, you saw the uh, oil well blow up in the yeah. I mean, uh, the, those kind of things are happening. So why are we getting distracted? Yeah. But mm. in terms of an ecology question, very difficult. I mean, even baboons are able to steal kill from cheetahs. So yeah. we, the answer to that question is there. Yeah, 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 very much. Uh, this is a follow-up question. Uh, this is from Jayant Kulkarni. Uh, or, yeah, so with reference to Prachi Mehta's question, uh, how advisable is to introduce lions at Kuno in the middle of tiger landscape? Will it not create conflicts. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of follow-up only. Uh, not create conflicts in species management and break of current tiger corridors between Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh. Giant and Prachi, I think it's very important for us to recognize that lions used to live through much of Western, Northern, and Central India. It is unreal to think there were watertight compartments in which tiger live and lion live from reconstruction of shikar records, and we all have spent time in the field, we know that what we call a dry deciduous forest will often have patches of moist deciduous forest, patches of grassland, patches of even evergreen forest, depending on local edaphic conditions. Reconstructing data from hunting literature, it does look very, very likely that lions and tigers had overlapping distribution. That doesn't mean they had 100% overlapping distribution, that, but in the same landscape, the more rugged, the more wetter, the more denser habitats would have been preferred by tigers. The flatter, drier, more open habitats would have been preferred by lions. If tigers and lions were so intolerant of each other, it is very, very unlikely that tigers could have reached as far east as Bihar, as far south as the Narmada River, and found in the current states of Gujarat, Rajasthan, Haryana, Delhi, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh. So lions in the past have been from this very, very broad geography. Mm. And lions did come to India through a natural process of dispersal after tigers had come. So mm. it is, from an ecological perspective, very, very clear mm -hmm. that lions and tigers know how to sort out their land disputes. Okay, okay. But, but a, a kind of controversial point over here, uh, Ravi, is that uh, initially frogs were thought uh, not able to traverse through salt waters kind of stuff, because I'm bringing in my subject over here even though it is lion, uh, elephant, and elef uh, and cheetahs. Uh, but recent studies show that uh, frogs have come from uh, ships. 
and they have established in uh, recent uh, discovery of frog says that one of the frog has established in Mangalore port. Uh, they need smaller areas. Uh, so as the species gets enlarged, probably uh, it's more complex than what we think about the smaller species. That could be one of the uh, key points to look into the ecology of larger species. And also uh, in terms of how they came uh, to Indian subcontinent or a newer uh, ecosystem. I think those are the key points to look into. The well, it is very, very clear that lions w did not come through human assistance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The history of lions predates mm -hmm. by a long, long time before human beings developed the skills and technology oh, okay. to travel that kind of distance and transport goods. And clearly, if people started transporting goods, transporting lions wouldn't have been a priority. Yeah. Uh, so, and you have records of lions. Uh, all the way through the Middle East, Tigris and Euphrates valleys were strongholds of lions. Mm -hmm. So it's not just in India that you see. You see okay. right all the way from North Africa and then yeah. uh, more or less continuously into India. Yeah. Uh, this question uh, goes to uh, Mr. Cosmos. Uh, so the, the question is, which is more adaptable? Uh, Wait a minute. Yeah, just a minute. Yeah, uh, this is by Simran. Uh, he says, uh, Mr. Cosmos, how adaptable are cheetahs? Are they are as adaptable as leopards? And and it also has a second question that low genetic variability in cheetahs is a natural occurrence, uh, or due to inbreeding, due to reducing populations. So there are yeah. So what is the issue for low genetic variability in cheetahs? Is it natural occurrence or it's inbreeding or reduced populations? And how adaptable uh, is a cheetah or as adaptable as leopards? Yeah. Oh, comparing <laughs> a cheetah's adaptability to a leopard is like comparing night and day. Oh. Uh, yes, uh, cheetahs, uh, not so adaptable. Um, first of all, because of the... Uh, the way they 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 hunt, the way they eat, um, cheetahs will make a kill, and they will eat as much as they can, and leave the rest. They will not come back. Okay. But leopards will take their prey and hide it somewhere on top of a tree or under a bush where nothing else will get it, mm -hmm. and they will keep on visiting it okay. until they finish. Okay. But also when you look at their diet range, leopard have a very wide diet range. They will take anything, even a mice, uh, starting from a mice all the way to, you know, young uh, elands and uh, young buffaloes. Mm -hmm. So they, they have a very wide range of, 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 uh, of, of, of prey. Mm. Uh, first of all, because of how they are built, uh, because the leopard is built like a boxer. They are heavy, they are yeah. powerful. They can take down more prey, more different species, um, as compared to cheetah. Mm. So uh, cheetahs are not you can't you can't compare them in terms of adaptability with leopard. Mm. Uh, now, on, in terms of uh, genetic variability, cheetahs have gone through two uh, genetic bottlenecks, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, human uh, activities, anthropogenic act activities have caused uh, pocketed populations. So, because naturally they already have such low genetic variability, when they are, they are confined in a small area, inbreeding, mm. the, the signs of inbreeding are so visible so quickly yeah. as compared to other species. So, you know, you start seeing the crowded lower incisors, you start seeing the kinked tails, cross eyes, all yeah. All these things, because when they are uh, when when they are in a moving and new genetic material coming, then there is a big big problem, and mm. I guess this is one of the difficulties mm. that we are having with data conservation, because their requirements are far much more than mm. most of the other uh, other carnivores. Um, so yeah, just to answer yeah. uh, their question, yes, they. Mm. It's natural. They've gone through two bottlenecks, okay. uh, genetic bottlenecks, but it's also exasperated by fragmentation. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yep. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, this question is to uh, Dr. Vini. Uh, this is from Adarsh. Uh, is the idea of flooding markets with fake ivory reduce or enhance poaching? Well, um, I think the ivory question is very complicated and uh, there are so many theories that people come with that could, if, some people even think that the reason that uh, burning ivory is a, is a bad thing is because it creates a fake demand for ivory. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. the whole question of fake ivory versus real ivory is also one that is uh, fraught with complications because by the time an individual is getting to the point where they are buying the ivory, they, they've done a lot of research. They are, they are yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a high, high, high price good. They, they, they can't make sure they are buying it. And so the cost of flooding means that you're mass manufacturing. And one wonders where that effort Pakistan, Deja, yeah. or issue. Yeah. I've had it many times, but I don't think it really comes from understanding how complicated this ivory business is and who really does it and who the buyers are. This is fairly sophisticated business. Yeah. To, uh, now the question is to, uh, I think, all three of you. Uh, how different conservation is and what is the relevance when talking about conservation in a large African continent with lesser human population uh, and large wide areas against conservation in a densely populated country like India? Uh, Dr. Vini, Dr. Ravi and Cosmos, your inputs are highly valuable here. You know, um, Africa, the continent, um, has the very sad distinction of being made up of countries that are fairly isolated from each other. It is much easier for me to travel to Mumbai than it is to travel to Accra in Ghana. <laughs> okay. Because we have the, uh, a, a, a colonial history that basically made our borders a real point of conflict and isolation. And so we are not talking about a contiguous landscape as one would maybe think of when talking about India. And so our complications are much more because each country has different political, social, economic, and cultural complexities. There are different values that are attributed, for instance, to conservation. And so we have a very complicated continental situation going on. I wish we were one country and we were dealing with federal governments, <laughs> but the truth is we are 50-some um, different countries. 37 of those countries have elephants. Their policies, their laws, their legislation, their cultures are so different that human population is only one of the issues that complicate the continental picture in as far as wildlife conservation is concerned. I can see where somebody who has not really known the geopolitical issues of Africa can see one huge landscape with less people and lots of space. But when you now understand the African geopolitical layout that each of those countries functions as an isolated unit with its own unique problems, then you realize that Population is just one of our problems. Yeah. Ravi uh, and Cosmos, your response. I, I do. I do completely agree with uh, with uh, Dr. Winnie. Um, Africa is is quite quite different, and as I mentioned, you know, national policies, land on wildlife, on economics. Um, will guide the direction uh, conservation or uh, the conservation text. Uh, um, 
uh, I mean, an example is just uh, two neighbors, you know, Kenya and Tanzania. We, we have completely different wildlife policies. Um, whereas Tanzania allows hunting, in Kenya it's not allowed. Um, you look at uh, South Africa and Namibia. You know, in Kenya, life belongs to all of us. In Namibia, if you are a landowner, you have some rights to the wildlife on your land. So it's, it's extremely difficult and, and population is just one of the aspects. Some of these things definitely do cut across the board. We are seeing fragmentation. We know what fragmentation will do to habitats. We know uh, what, uh, what uh, blocking of corridors will do to the animal populations. But when it comes to actually doing something uh, cross-continent, it becomes very difficult to navigate a lot of geopolitical differences that exist. Um, whereas in India, you guys, maybe you have, you have the state government, but you also have the federal government. You have two tires that you have to navigate through. Um, so it's, it's, it's very different. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and population is just one aspect of the differences. Yeah. Okay. Um, while we are one country, uh, in terms of uh, cultural differences, I think we could quite rival uh, the differences running across Africa. Um, so that's something I wanted to put out there on the table. But I think the bigger question really is not about population, but about the, de the so-called development model that we seem to have adopted. And the tragedy is that even the pandemic doesn't seem to make us question enough the development model. What is this development that makes each human being on this world worry about her or his life on a daily basis? I mean, you can't leave your home. I mean, is this development? This is what development has resulted. You can't leave your home. That is for people who are lucky to have a home and who can work from home. Imagine the status of people who don't have homes. And we have seen that quite starkly in India when people had to move back and so on and so forth, the fate that they had to deal with. So we are asking the wrong questions here. We are not willing to learn the lesson. We want to go back to the normal. What is the normal? The normal is what has resulted in where we are now. I think it's very, very crucial that we don't view wildlife and environment as independent of human well-being. And as long as we, and we need refer to the One Health, and there's more than One Health that we need to be thinking about because resources are finite, but greed is infinite. And as long as that question is not addressed, we say we might think we have won a conservation battle and the unfortunate thing with conservation victories are there ephemeral you can go to sleep thinking you won and next morning there will be a fresh challenge for us to deal and there are global challenges for decades climate change is one and now is the pandemic which don't know any boundaries or borders so you know drawing these little maps saying that's my protected area I will protect my wildlife within it. Climate change doesn't respect those boundaries. Pandemics don't uh, respect those boundaries. And always trying to see at local communities as the problem, move them from the land to create what are called as pristine nature and inviolate areas is, is, is no longer smart. It has not yielded dividends to continue investing in this failed model of conservation really is galling. When are we going to look at real data? When are we going to look at the need for connectivity, not just between protected areas, but with living landscapes? We have to look at human beings as part of the conservation goal and not as out of the conservation goal. I don't know whether I answered your question, Guru. Yeah, it, it, it does. Uh, uh, it, in similar line, there is also another question to all three of you. Uh, I also agree with you, uh, Ravi, on uh, the point of involving people. Without people, I think we can't do any conservation, that's for sure. Uh, 
this next question is uh, by Simran to all the panelists is, what are your thoughts on game reserves? Uh, just give a pause here, guys, like how many more minutes you will be able to spend with us uh, because it's already one hour of question answer sessions we are into. Uh, is it fine if we take two more questions and then i'm happy for the next 15 minutes and then i have yes. to go down for dinner otherwise i'll lose my dinner okay so, what about uh, uh, dr vini and uh, mr cosmos how about your situation sure it's okay 10, okay. 10 minutes 10 15 minutes it's 10 15 okay. minutes perfect okay i think i have only a couple more questions but uh, i just wanted to know your status but yeah no, so just uh, can i go first Yes, please. Yes, please. Sure. Just a bit of couple of points on the uh, on the first uh, the earlier question. We also yeah. cannot forget aspects of justice, yeah. equality, accountability, and transparency. Yeah. I mean, simple thing like wildlife census in India are a state secret. You don't know how what methods they use and how they arrive at the numbers, and it's using public money that these censuses are carried out. Yep. Okay. So that's that's let that aside. Now on game reserves, it's not very clear to me what is meant by game reserves. Game reserves, yeah. Because in, in the Indian context, we don't have game reserves. Yeah. Is it is it a hunting concession? Are we talking about? I mean, what if you, if the person who's asked the question is still there? Yes. If we can get a little bit more clarity on what a game reserve is, we might be able to engage with it. Uh, Simran, uh, are you able to uh, respond to this? Simran, are you there? Possibly not. Uh, Simran is there. Yes. Okay. Can, so, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? What What do you mean by game reserve? How have you question framed on what's your thought process on that? I think somebody so like Naveen will have to unmute. unmute. Oh, okay. Oh, her mic is, oh, not, mic is not working. Can working. you just type it? Simran, yeah, can, can you just type? Okay. Maybe as she as he or she types, can we move on to the yeah, next one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, there are uh, other question by Sanjay Ajnikar. So he says uh, many thanks to all the panelists. It's a wonderful, uh, insightful presentation. Considering both countries, we have come along a way with respect to conservation efforts. And while appreciating those, I would like to ask, what is respective countries stand today on uh, in quotes? focusing landscapes, biodiversity, and human wildlife conflict, while working on long-term strategic conservation planning. With the V, conservation plans targeted to specific species, since both countries are populated, dependent on forest and agriculture. Okay, I, I will attempt. I don't think I have a direct answer, but I, I think that what uh, um, Ravi has been addressing himself to is, is, is particularly just this, that uh, we have to start to, to rethink our conservation model because we can't just focus on uh, what species without thinking about landscapes and connectivity and the ecosystems within which these species have to be conserved. We can't just think of conflict without thinking of coexistence. And mm. who are these species going to co uh, coexist with? We can't wish for India without the people. Neither can we wish for Africa without the people. Mm. You know, one time I had somebody say, Africa would be just fine if there were no people. Mm. But there are 1.3 billion people, yeah. right? <laughs> and, and the population is growing. So Africa has people, India has people. And we must think about conservation in a more holistic way. Right. And what stops us from doing this is the lack of transparency, the fact that we do not focus on justice, the fact that we think conservation is something that we can do, hide the data, do our own thing. And yet, the very people who impact our conservation strategies the most are those same people with whom we are not willing to share information. 
those same people who are disenfranchised every which way we look. During our political decision making, we have pretend community participation, but these people are not really being listened to. Our development model makes them poorer instead of more empowered. And so really conservation efforts across both Africa and Asia will only succeed when we are holistic about them and when we grow our own homegrown solutions that are properly appreciated by the people for whom we pretend to plan. As long as we continue looking in books and going to conferences somewhere else and then coming back to try and impose the ideas that we get from those conferences, as long as we drive through the roads and the trains in Denmark and Brussels and get really impressed and come and build those in India and Africa, we, we, we are lost, <laughs> you know, we are lost. We, we, we have to come up with a paradigm shift we have to have a conservation ethic that includes our people. And then we can start talking about coexistence instead of conflict. We can start talking about landscapes instead of small uh, species confinement. We can start thinking about our countries in a more holistic way. And let's face it, there are certain species we will not be able to conserve because we have been going the wrong way for so long there are some we are going to lose. But if we don't change our paradigm, if we don't start thinking about the people in the forefront, we're going to lose everything. We're going to stay at home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, Maybe let's carry on the African theme and then I will. Yeah, yeah, maybe. sure, sure. Cosmos? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's, it's, it's actually something that uh, as an individual um, that I've worked really hard to ensure that we maintain and this is working with the communities where we work and uh, demystifying what we do. It shouldn't be rocket science even if somebody has never gone to school. Learning from them because I believe when you teach you learn we also teach learning from the communities where we work that we are trying to impact there is traditional knowledge that makes a whole lot of difference and most of the time we fight with talking at them and not listening that we end up losing focus. Um, using, definitely we will continue using some flagship species because they represent more than the species. The elephant is not only a symbol of majesty, but you conserve, you, you come up with, with, a, with, a, with a better way of protecting the ecosystem that supports the elephant. And I can tell you, you support thousands or millions of other species. These animals are facing the same, same challenges. But we keep going in the wrong direction. And that is why we have pulled back. First of all, as an organization, we try to engage with people on a level that both of us can talk at, talk to each other and not at each other. Because we have, we have tried the, 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 the other way around. It has not worked. When you sit down with an engineer and they give you the reasons why they have chosen. Oops. Yes, my power is out. Okay. I'm, I'm, Am I okay? You are, yeah. you are visible, yeah. yes. They, they give you the reasons why they have chosen a certain design. You begin to understand where they're coming from. Um, and then you talk to them about the wildlife needs and why we need to vary the design a little bit so that 
you know, these animals can, can, can walk through. So we stop being anti-development because that's what, unfortunately, it's what conservation, uh, conservationists are viewed as. We are viewed as anti-development, that we are not subscribing to the, in quote, to the, the current development. Um, so landscapes, of course, there is no question about it. We can't conserve these small pockets. They won't last. And I know it's, it's, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard, but we will keep fighting slowly. We will keep moving forward and trying to find the best way to have a conversation that is devoid of ill feelings and where these projects are not viewed, where we, we, we are not viewed as anti all these projects. And because the animals need somebody to speak for them, isn't it? Wow, that's wonderful thoughts. Ravi? See, I, I mean, we are lucky in India that vast majority of the population are culturally attuned to have some element of reverence for nature. Uh, either through religion or through whatever reason. So coexistence is somewhat inbuilt into the manner in which India operates at the people and citizens level. Unfortunately, that is missing completely from governmental thinking and governmental action. So there's a huge disconnect between how I'm not just talking of traditional communities and forest dwelling communities, even in villages, small towns and cities, you will find people whose attitude towards nature is that of reverence, that of coexistence. Nature and wildlife are not seen as enemies or anti-humans or as a danger. So that's a brilliant foundation that we should have built on. Our conservation ideology, ethics and models should have grown out of that. For whatever reason, we decided to adopt the Yellowstone model of fortress conservation. When early on also, but more significantly when the 1972 Wildlife Conservation Act was promulgated. And even there in the act, we had some very pro-people clauses, which unfortunately were never really implemented. As a result, we got the Forest Rights Act about 20 years ago. So you have a couple of legislation kind of seen at loggerheads. You have a lot of the human population having a certain attitude towards nature and environment. And then you have the government more or less working at 180 degrees away from the way the people are thinking. Now, this has neither resulted in true development, nor has it really resulted in sustainable conservation. In India, we've gone into the bad habit of measuring conservation merely by animal population. And the quality of those numbers be set aside. In general, animal populations have also gone up. But is that the only metric by which we should even be looking at conservation? What about habitat integrity? What about habitat connectivity? Are large mammals the only goal for you in conservation? Shouldn't ecosystem integrity and functioning be important for you to consider? Shouldn't overall environmental health be an important issue to consider? What about lives of people who live with wildlife, who interact with wildlife, who interact with nature on a daily basis? How can we say after 70 or more years of independence that we are a developed country when people still go hungry to bed, when people are not able to you know, access clean water. Aren't these the goals of conservation? So to me, it, it is important that we broaden our understanding of what conservation is. 
if you really want to sustain it. With 1.3 billion people, the more we try to keep people away from wildlife, the less you're going to succeed because you can't keep wildlife away from the people. Our protected areas are small. They are getting increasingly disconnected. So people are now asking, you want elephants to conserve? Take it to your house in Bangalore. Don't allow it to come into my house. Earlier, when I started 30, 40 years ago, people were quite happy to accommodate wildlife in their lives. But we have thrown people out of protected areas. So you can't live with this contradiction. But as I stated earlier, the bigger problem is the model of development. Unless we constantly question the model of development, not because from a political opposition or an ideological opposition, but from purely economic and environmental reasons. Is this the best way? To, and the government is not spending their personal money. The government is spending the money of the public of India. And they are voted to do that and they are accountable to us. So all of us need to become far more active citizens globally. Allowing, I mean, there is no global political leadership. You just have to listen to the top five, six country leaders to understand that. It is about winning the next election. That is the only goal of political leadership today. And unless we become wise enough to that, we can keep talking till the cows come home. Nothing is going to change. Wow. Uh, I think we'll uh, end this session. Thank you, uh, guys, uh, uh, Dr. Vini, Cosmos, and uh, Dr. Ravi. Uh, before we end, we have to conclude with uh, Simran's question on game reserves. Uh, and she has come back in asking that uh, game reserve meant for uh, uh, where animals are bred just for hunting purposes. So what is your take on that? So if you guys can just spend... Complete, uh, complete no-no yeah. from so many, uh, so many perspectives. Um, ethical to begin with. I mean, the minute we start losing our ethical grounding in any of human action, that's a slippery slope. And from an Indian perspective, it is just illegal. So from India, there's no question of operating game business. Okay. Uh, Cosmos and Vini, Dr. Vini, uh, would you like to say Cosmos. anything? You're muted, Cosmos. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as I was saying, in Kenya, is the, 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 the definition of a game reserve is a bit uh, different. Um, because wildlife is owned by Kenyans and entrusted to the government to protect it for all of us. We have two categories of nationally, um, I would say, government-run um, protect, protected areas. One of them is the national parks and the other one are the uh, game reserves. So the game reserves are run by local authorities. The national parks are run by the national, by Kenya Wildlife Service, which is the national organization charged with the responsibility of managing wildlife on behalf of Kenyans. So uh, there's, there's no hunting in Kenya. So I don't know what I can say about that, but the, the game reserves do allow partial use by local communities where they are located. So they will allow, let's say, partial grazing um, during certain times. Um, the national parks uh, legally, they basically, they shouldn't be allow any human activity apart from you know, the, the tourist uh, um, activities that are taking part uh, there. But both of them are uh, protected areas. One is under the local authority of the local people, the, 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 the local government, and the other one is under the national government. Dr. Wini, you have any responses for this? I think Cosmos has explained the situation okay. in Makoto, yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you. Thanks once again, Dr. Wini, uh, Mr. Cosmos, Wambua, and Dr. Ravi. It was pleasant discussing with you and the issues that we faced on uh, elephants, cheetah, and the issues in India. Uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, I think now I will hand over this to Anusha. She will do the word of thanks. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gurat. 
uh, indeed a wonderful session with initially almost more than 85 participants joining us on a Saturday evening. I guess some of them are hungry now. They must have dropped out. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, it is very heartening to know that many of us care, uh, care about our wildlife and the conservation. Many questions uh, that are floating around and that goes to show that we still need to work on a lot of areas. I would like to thank all the uh, speakers today once again, Dr. Vini, uh, Mr. Cosmos, Dr. Ravi Chalam, and uh, Dr. Guraj. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your wonderful experiences and uh, giving us your time on the Saturday afternoon. Thank you. Good night to one and all. Thank you very much. Thank you.